first I, I would like to thank the Indian Institute of Advanced Study for giving me this opportunity uh, to share my half-baked ideas with such, a, such an august audience. Uh, seldom do we have opportunity to interact with such an audience. Uh, and I am personally indebted to Professor Eshitam Shishekhar Chakraborty, who um, initiated me into reading virtue ethics. In fact, it is while talking with him, I became interested in reading uh, contemporary Western virtue ethics. <laughs> now, uh, this presentation uh, falls in, uh, into two parts. In the first part, uh, I have made an attempt to give a very brief and very, I should say, superficial, kind of superficial introduction to contemporary virtue ethics, uh, which perhaps in a way is very redundant because contemporary Western virtue ethics is known to everybody present here. And still, uh, I'd like to hurry through the uh, Western part and then move on to the main part of my presentation, which will be uh, a presentation of the ethics of the Srimad Bhagavad Gita from the perspective of virtue ethics. I just need to mention one word of caution. Gita has so many interpretations. In fact, in classical India itself, there were 11 major commentaries on the Gita. My uh, presentation of the Gita will be entirely from the Advaita Vedanta perspective. I am not mixing up many perspectives on the Gita, not even the Sankhya perspective, because the Advaita Vedanta perspective is opposed to the Sankhya perspective as well. Even though these perspectives are very close, very, very close to one another. Uh, and my uh, presentation will not be based uh, on Shankaracharya's commentary on the Gita. It will be based on a single commentary, and that is Madhusudana Saraswati's, my favorite, my Madhusudana Saraswati's, Guratha Dibi. The second half of the 20th century witnessed a very important development in the field of modern philosophy. With the publication of the paper Modern Modern Philosophy by G. E. M. Anscombe in 1958, the existing model theories were subjected to a scathing criticism. The growing dissatisfaction with the prevalent model theories led to the revival of an old form of moral philosophy. This old moral philosophy, as we all know, had its origin in the writings of the ancient Greek philosophers, such as Plato, Aristotle, and the Stoic philosophers. Later on, this tradition came to be known as the virtue theory tradition, or virtue ethics. This word itself, uh, I think, cannot be found in ancient Greek philosophy. This is a later coinage. There are, however, significant differences between the ancient versions of this theory and its modern formulations. The modern construals are very, very different from the ancient Aristotelian uh, eudaimonic uh, virtue ethics. It may be noted that theories similar to virtue ethics that prevalent in other ancient traditions as well. I'm just calling them similar. I'm not trying to uh, attempt any kind of reduction because uh, that will lead to lots of lots and lots of problems. The object of this presentation is to present a modern philosophy prevalent in classical India, namely the ethics of the Srimad Bhagavad Gita, which bear significant resemblances uh, to the virtue theories. But as this theory has its origin in an entirely different philosophical tradition, it has its own peculiar features as well. The presentation falls into three sections. In the first section, I shall address the issue, what is virtue ethics? Here I shall try to state at least some of the major features that distinguish virtue ethics from other forms of ethical theories. In this section, I shall also discuss 
this does imprint the main reasons that lead, this is the important part, that lead to the revival of this form of ethical theories in the second half of the 20th century. The second section will give a short but textual presentation of the ethics of the Gita. The third and the concluding section will try to answer the question whether this ancient moral theory may be considered as a virtue theory or not. Very simple. Uh, the framework is very simple. Uh, Matt Zolinsky and David Sprintz in their 2005 article, Virtue Ethics and Department uh, Conclusions, try to mention a few salient features that set about virtue ethics from other forms of moral theories. Virtue ethics is so different, it might be best to see it not as an alternative answer to the same question but as responding to a different question altogether. We must bear in mind this observation. Perhaps virtue ethics and duty ethics are not addressing the same question at all. Uh, we, try to give, we shall try to come back to this question later also. Often associated with Aristotle, virtue ethics tells us that what is right is to be a certain kind of person a person of virtue, courageous, modest, honest, kind-handed, and so on. A virtuous person will, of course, express his or her virtues through actions. But for virtue ethics, the specification of rules of right action is largely a secondary matter. Specification of rules is a secondary problem. One that in many ways presupposes the kind of practical wisdom possessed by the person of virtue. So the main uh, point of virtue ethics is to specify who is a person of virtue and what kind of action will be considered as actions, dutiful actions, will depend on the practical wisdom of the person who is a person of virtue. Uh, for this reason, virtue ethics is also sometimes referred to as agent ethics. That is why it is uh, uh, described as agent ethics. Because what is a righteous action often uh, depends upon the practical judgment of a person of virtue. And there may not be any hard and fast rule which can lay down that this is a righteous action and this is not. Uh, perhaps the practical wisdom of a, person, of a person of virtue may uh, advise us otherwise. We see that a particular action which is universally accepted as a righteous action is not a righteous action in one particular circumstance. That may happen in case of virtue ethics. This is the main uh, distinction which people make between agent-based ethics and rule-based ethics. Uh, that is why it is referred to as agent ethics as contrasted with the existing moral theories which are often referred to as rule-based ethics. But is it at all fair to club all existing contemporary moral theories under one category and the virtue theories under another? Is this classification justified? It is a well-known fact that the moral theories prevalent in the 20th century before the emergence of the virtue theories were broadly divided into two groups. This is known to everybody, the utilitarian theories and the deontological theories. But why do the virtue theories refer to both these kinds of theories as rule ethics or act ethics and consider them as equally unsatisfactory? The exponents of virtue ethics believe that there are more similarities between utilitarianism and deontology than there are differences. This is the main point of virtue ethics. This will not be admitted by any utilitarian or by any deontologist. But the virtue theory says that there are more similarities between utilitarianism and deontology than there are differences. Both these forms of moral theories subscribe to the following tenets. First, all human beings 
are bound by certain duties. And these duties are either logically prior to or are derived from certain conception of good. This is where the utilitarians and the deontologists differ. The deontologists could say that the concept of a law, the supreme principle of morality, is the logically prior one. And of course the utilitarians, the consequentialists would say that the conception of good is the logically prior one and the conception of uh, uh, morally right action is derived from the conception of good. Second, moral reasoning is viewed as application of certain principles to particular cases. Particular cases are subsumed under general principles. In fact, Kant uh, posited a separate faculty, the faculty of judgment, for subsuming uh, instances under uh, universal laws or universal principles. So this is very important that uh, all moral reasoning is viewed as application of certain principles to particular cases. Third, the concept of virtue is derived either from the concept of right or from the concept of good. So both the utilitarians and the deontologists believe that the concept of virtue is a logically derivative one, dependent on either the concept of good or the concept of duty. Now, the virtue theories come up with many arguments against utilitarianism and deontology. Since both deontology and utilitarianism assign a central role to the concepts of duty and moral obligation, both these theories subscribe to a legislative conception of morality, a law-based conception of morality. But the concept of law always presupposes a law given, a sanctioning authority, or an institution that has the power or authority to impose the law on subjects or individuals who fall under the jurisdiction of the law. But the concept of a moral law or moral duty is free-floating. This term is used, is free-floating, in the sense that uh, no law giver can be found in the case of moral law. The virtue theorists also are not ready to accept the Kantian view that the supreme principle of morality is derived from pure reason and hence it is self-legislating. The virtue theories, at least Anscom, is very much opposed to the idea that the moral law is a self-legislating law. Okay, there have been uh, attempts uh, after Anscom to re revive this conception of a self-legislating law following Kant's line. I am not going into, I do not have time to go into such attempts. G. M. Anscom subjected this conception of a self-legislating law to a severe critic. In modern times, morality is usually considered as independent of religion. So the ancient strategy of considering God to be the lawgiver also is no longer a viable option. The conclusion which Anscombe draws from these arguments is that the conception of duty can no longer be made the cornerstone of moral philosophy. Philippa Foote later describes the moral art as free-floating and unsubscribed in a way which makes this notion unintelligible. The basis of this notion is not very clear. That is what Foote observes. Richard Taylor in his Ancient Wisdom and Modern Folly says that the concept of moral obligation as different from and superior to any other sort of obligation is an empty concept. That uh, it is superior to religious obligation, it is superior to uh, state law, it is superior to any other kind of institutional law, that is moral law as viewed uh, superior to any other kind of obligation is an empty concept. But if the concept of moral obligation is an empty concept, then why do such a vast majority of philosophers consider this concept to be the most fundamental concept of moral philosophy. These philosophers say that, this is their statement, that some theory of error, some theory of illusion 
is needed to account for this very general misconception. If this is really a misconception at all. Richard Taylor again in his book Ethics, Faith and Reason offered an historical argument, this is not a philosophical argument at all, to account for this very common belief that moral obligation is the most basic concept of any moral theory. Taylor argues that the concept of moral obligation as different from any other kind of obligation did not play a very key role in ancient Greek moral philosophy. Ancient Greek philosophers were primarily concerned with the notion of a good life uh, for human beings and the traits of character necessary for obtaining or attaining such a good life. But a paradigm shift came in modern philosophy with the advent of Christianity. Where this is a historical argument where God was considered to be the lawgiver. The virtue theories thus are not proposing an ethics which is absolutely new, but in a way they are proposing a theory which is a revival of an ancient form of moral theory. Anscombe also argued that instead of making the notion of duty, the key notion of moral philosophy, the concept of virtue which is understood as part of human flourishing, this is the word which Anscombe used, must be considered as the basis of all moral philosophy. Barnard Williams and Michael Sloot have developed another argument, namely the argument from moral luck or the paradox of moral luck to bring out the problematic character of the deontological theories. They have argued that the deontological theories cannot solve the paradox of moral luck. An action may be looked upon as obligatory for a person only if the person, this is the argument of Michael Sloot, an, an action may be looked upon as obligatory for a person only if the person has the freedom to perform that action. Just as a robot who is controlled by someone else cannot be held responsible for its actions, so also a person who is under the control of some other thing or some other person cannot be held responsible for her actions. Now an agent's actions are largely controlled by various factors which are uh, not under the agent's control. Uh, these factors may be clubbed together and be roughly designated as the agent's moral law. For instance, Kant would say that the empirical ego is fully determined by causal laws. It cannot transcend the causal laws. So, uh, freedom uh, of will is not given in experience. It's not an object of experience. It's only a regulative idea. Isn't it? That is why Kant uh, clearly recognized this problem, this tension between uh, freedom and determinism. He knew that the empirical ego, the empirical self is fully determined by causal laws. So, the empirical ego cannot have any freedom altogether. But still, freedom is a basic postulate of morality. So, what is freedom? It is only a regulative idea of purism and nothing else. It can never be the object of experience. Since one cannot be held responsible for one's moral luck, how can one be held responsible for actions? that are to a very great extent controlled by moral law? This is the question raised by Michael Sloat and others. The notion of virtue as constitutive of human flourishing is derived from Aristotle's conception of eudaimonia. This term was coined by Aristotle in his Nicomachean Ethics and it means the life of virtue. Aristotle subscribed to the view that there is nothing more valuable in life than the exercise of virtues. Virtue ethics not merely emphasizes on the life of virtue, rather virtue ethics subscribes to a stronger thesis. Virtue ethics is not merely promoting or propagating a life of virtue. It is saying something more stronger, much more stronger. It is saying that the concept of virtue and the other the artistic or virtue-based concepts are more fundamental. 
than the deontic or obligation centered concepts. Thus, virtue ethics not merely upholds the thesis that a life worth living is a life of virtue. On the contrary, it tries to account for moral obligation and other ethical concepts in terms of the notion of virtue. So the whole debate centers around what is logically prior to what? What is the primary notion? Now, there are different forms of virtue ethics. There is, however, a lot of controversy among the present-day virtue theorists regarding the logical primacy of the notion of the notion of the notion of virtue. Michael Sloat, for instance, subscribes to a moderate version of virtue ethics. Michael Sloat, uh, moderate versions of virtue ethics claim uh, that though judgments of character are independent of judgments of action, yet some judgments of actions too are independent of judgments of character. There are actions which are wrong irrespective of the character of the person or the motive behind those actions. Usually virtue ethicists say that judgments of character are independent of the judgments of actions and judgments of actions should be based on judgments of character. But Michael Sloat slightly differs from this extreme interpretation or extreme formulation of virtue theory. Michael Sloat says that there are actions which are wrong, uh, which are wrong independent of judgments of character. So they are wrong irrespective of the character of the person or the motive of the person who performs those actions. So he uh, writes, Sloat writes, the ethical status of acts is not entirely derivative from that of traits, motives, or individuals, even though traits and individuals are the major, major focus of the ethical views uh, uh, being offered. This is from Michael Sloat, from morality to virtue. Now I pass on to the second section where I present the ethics of the Gita. The entire Srimad Bhagavad Gita is directed towards a moral dilemma. It's directed towards solving a moral dilemma. It should be noted that the problem addressed by this ancient work is not an emotion, is not merely an emotional or a psychological crisis. Many interpret it as offering a solution to Arjuna's emotional or psychological crisis but it is not so. A very deep moral dilemma uh, lies uh, underneath this emotional and psychological crisis. Orjuno was very well aware of the moral laws. Mm, he was a well person, well conversant in moral laws. So it's a moral dilemma and the text addresses a specifically moral problem. Okay. So, mm, I am not saying that the emotional, psychological issues are unimportant, but at least uh, for a discussion on moral philosophy, the moral dilemma is the most important part. In fact, this ancient text is directed towards solving very complicated and tricky moral issues. It does not also present any piecemeal or ad hoc solutions of these moral problems. On the contrary, uh, it presents a very comprehensive ontology that is capable of explaining any major phenomenon that forms part of an individual's life, experience, and the context of such experience. The ethics proposed in this treatise is a logical outcome of this ontology. So the metaphysics is the most important part. The ethics follows from the ontology. It is no ad hoc. Uh, uh, this is not a code of conduct. This is not a creed. This is a... Uh, uh, a holistic philosophy, a full-fledged philosophy. Thus the Gita is not a mere code of conduct that prescribes or prohibits certain actions, rather it presents a very general and comprehensive philosophy and the ethics of the Gita follows directly from this general philosophy. The moral dilemma addressed in this text arises between a conflict between two duties one of which is very general and the other is specific to a particular warno. Now what are these two duties? The
The first is in the Vedas it has been prescribed na hinsya sarva bhutani. That is one cannot perpetrate, uh, one cannot commit any sort of violence towards any being in cases other than a sacrificial occasion. This principle na hinsya sarva bhutani. It comes into conflict with another Vedic injunction, which is Ognishomyam Poshom Alavetu, that is, sacrifice a, a white animal uh, for the uh, deities Ogni and Shom. So, the Chalvakas, the atheists, they raise the objection that these uh, scriptures are nothing but a bundle of contradiction, uh, enjoining. Non-violence in one place and violence to be perpetrated on animals on other occasions. So this is a bundle of contradictions. As we all know that the entire Mimamsa philosophy was directed towards resolving these apparent contradictions. The Mimamsa they developed more than thousand techniques which they call Nayam or Odhikarana. Each Mimamsa chapter or Odhikarana specifies a particular nayo to interpret the scriptures. These are the rules of, they specify the rules of interpretation. Uh, all these rules, they constitute, uh, so to speak, the Indian hermeneutics. Now, there was a particular nayo called the Savakasha Niravakasha nayo, which specified that whenever there is a conflict between a more general rule and a less general rule, the less general rule will be stronger and the more general rule will be weaker. Why? Because if the less general rule is said to be less strong or the more general rule is considered as stronger than the less general rule, then the less general rule will have to be forfeited altogether. It will have to be given up. Now, if some rule is given up, then there will be a doubt with respect to the veracity of the entire Vedas. So, that can't be done. So, this is the rule pertaining to all general and specific rules, even in case of grammar. Whenever a general rule comes into conflict with a specific rule, the specific rule overrides. And the general rule has to make room, make space for the special rule. So, what is to be done? The general rule needs to be uh, restricted. A restricted interpretation has to be adopted. Also, probably the exam. Yes, for instance, uh, I don't have time to go into instances. For instance, take the grammatical rule that whenever we combine uh, a letter ending with okaro or any swallow or no, with um, a word starting with cho, with a cho, then a cho is to be um, interpolated. Such as bonu chaya, bonu chaya, toru chaya, toru chaya, mosu chanda, mosu chanda, and so on and so forth. But there is an exception. Lakshmi chaya is not Lakshmi chaya. It is Lakshmi chaya. Why? Because here the specific rule overrides. And if the specific rule is given up, then one will come to doubt the entire drama, the entire discipline of drama. The same thing happens here. So now Hinsayat Sarva Bhutani is not uh, interpreted, is not given a blanket interpretation. It is said that on occasions different from uh, <coughs> sacrifices, um, absolute non-violence is to be exercised. One should not uh, commit any sort of violence towards any being. Whatsoever. Apart from sacrificial occasions. But the Varna Dharma or the specific duties of a Shkotriyo enjoins a Shkotriyo to uh, perpetrate violence on the occasion of war. Violence uh, on the occasion of war is justified for a Shkotriyo. So, uh, Orjuna is uh, between the two horns of a dilemma that uh, is he to follow the general rule no himsyat sarva bhutani or should he follow his bordo that, that is the uh, dilemma which Gita uh, addresses. And Orjuna is under two illusions, two moves. Yes, there are 
two modes. First of which is he considers himself and all other sentient beings as identical with their bodies. He has dehatma buddhi. He identifies himself with his body. And he also thinks that Vishma, Drono, etc., all of uh, the, uh, his opponents also are identical with their bodies. And so, if their bodies are destroyed, they will be destroyed. And some sort of violence will be perpetrated against them. This is the first general moral, the first general delusion uh, entertained by Arjuna, entertained by the agent who was uh, subject to doubt, who was under doubt. Now, there was another delusion as well, that whether uh, violence should be perpetrated against relatives and uh, persons who are superior to him, who were his teachers, his uh, grandfather, and so on and so forth. Now, uh, often people worry, why did uh, Sri Krishna uh, give such a long uh, exposition of Akpotatva, of the nature of the self, at the very beginning of the Gita. What was the purpose of this Sankhya Yoga? Why did Sri Krishna uh, elaborate on the nature of the self? That is because it was directed to uh, dispelling the first mom, which, uh, which is about Dehatma Buddhi. When a person is under the first form of delusion, he identifies, he or she identifies his own self with his body, his mind, and his sense organ. To dispel that doubt that you are not your body, you are not your sense organ, you are not your mind, the danger of the self is, has been elaborated upon by uh, Lord Sri Krishna. So, the moral dilemma addressed in this text arises between a conflict between two duties. The dilemma and the resulting inertia or inaction are actually caused by certain delusions. And to remove these, the first of these delusions is caused by a misconception about the nature of the self. To remove this misconception, the nature of the self is discussed at length in the second chapter of the Gita. The Gita propounds the thesis that every individual in reality is identical with pure consciousness, which is eternal, ubiquitous, which is nithya, which is sarvopyapi, ubiquitous, which is indestructible, uh, and which is changeless, which does not undergo any transformation. The same for Atman is not born and it does not suffer from death and decay. The self is pure being, pure consciousness, and pure bliss. This is only a statement of their position. Madhusudana does not merely state the position, but this is a commentary where he gives an extensive justification in favor of the Advaita metaphysics. He says that, okay, everything rests on their conception or their criterion of reality. How do they, how do the uh, Advaita Vedantins or how does Gita or how do the scriptures for that matter define reality? Reality is defined in terms of a specific property, one specific property. And that property is Avadhitatva. That which is not falsifiable by any subsequent experience. This is the criterion of reality subscribed to by the Gita, at least from the Advaita interpretation, from the Advaita perspective, and by the Advaita Vedantics as a whole. The entire Advaita system uh, subscribes to this definition or criterion of reality. Now, uh, as we can well imagine, no other system, no other philosopher is ready to accept this criterion of reality? Why should they? Why should the Nyayiko accept this criterion of reality? For the Nyayiko, the criterion of reality is Satta Samobhaitam. That is, that is real where the Satta universal, where the universal being or Satta decides by the relation of inherence, where the Satta Jati is inherent. And there are three, only three such categories, substance, Attribute and action, dropio, guno, and karma. Okay, and we all know that all systems, all ancient classical systems, had their own uh, peculiar criteria of reality.
reality. For instance, the Buddhists proposed the criterion orthopriya karitva lakshanam sal. That which is real is capable of producing effects. The Jaina philosopher said, Utpada vyaya drogo jittam sal. So no one is prepared to accept this very stringent condition, criterion of reality which will uh, lead to a monistic uh, metaphysics. So what Madhushudana does is the main work, the main underdigging is done by Madhushudana. Madhushudana says that no other criterion of reality stands the test of reason. No other criterion of reality stands the test of reason. So, I am referring to Professor Moito's question, do they consider their theory to be falsifiable or not? Yes, they consider their theory to be refutable or falsifiable. That is the reason why they engaged into debates with all other systems and they tried to refute uh, the thesis of all other systems. If they were not falsifiable at all, then there will be no <coughs> debate at all. The uh, science should be exercised. Okay. Uh, so, uh, Mosul Sudan has showed that the criteria proposed by others are not uh, logically tenable. To mention just, uh, just very briefly, the main argument against the narrow conception, which is the most dominant conception. Uh, what did Mosul Sudan say? Mosul Sudan say that you are saying that those things are real, where which appear as real and you are positing a universal in all those things. Namely the universal being or the universal sata. But what will happen to the other categories? You have admitted four more categories, universals, the uh, ultimate differentiators, the vishechos, the inherent samubayo, which is which, uh, on the narrow view, the main relation between the substances and the attributes and the main on many other occasions, the main relation is samubayo. What will happen to Omhavo, which is another category admitted by the Noyaikos, they also appear to us as real. The Noyaikos have very prompt answers to all these questions, like the Nobunoyaikos. They will say, no, no problem at all. Uh, we will say that Sattajati resides also in Samanno and Visheshu by the relation, by a different relation. And that relation is Ekartha Samubayo. Ekartha samabayo means being present in the same ortho, ego ortho, same ortho by the relation of samabayo. Take a pot for instance or a piece of cloth where sata also resides and drobotto also resides. So, so drobotto and sata bear the relation of being inherent in the same piece of cloth. So there is a relation between sata and samanu. There will be a similar relation between sata and vishicho and ekartha samanadhi karano, locating or being located in the same locus, can be found between uh, samabayo and sata and between abhavo and sata as well. Now comes the Advaitin's main argument. This is a very crucial epistemological argument. So, the Advaitin's would say that the Nunyanikos are positing three different objects to account for uh, a perception which has the same form on all uh, cases, in all circumstances. So, three different objects are positive to account for perceptions having the same form. But it's a basic principle of epistemology that all identity and all differences should be justified by differences in the forms of cognition. Unless the forms of cognition differ, we can't say that the object uh, has differed. For instance, we are seeing two flower bouquets here. Tomorrow we'll come here and if we see the same bouquet, we'll say that the Indian Institute of Advanced Study have not, has not replaced the flower bouquets. Okay? We are making a judgment of identity. And if I see uh, blue flowers and other flowers, well, I will say that the Indian Institute has replaced the bouquet. So, how do we do that? How do we make this judgment of identity? On the basis of the forms of cognition. And as long as the forms of cognition don't differ, the object cannot differ. No identity, uh, no entity without identity. No entity without identity and there must be a, an identity criterion and the identity criterion comes from the form of the cognition. So, uh, the Madhusudharam uh, refutes all other criteria of uh, reality. 
and shows that this is the only tenable criterion of reality. A person who attains uh, final immediate awareness of this true nature of uh, himself or herself, that is, the person who attains final immediate awareness of pure consciousness lives a life of virtue. He lives a life of virtue. In such a virtuous individual is called a Sita Pradyo. Uh, Arjuna asks uh, Krishna, Sita Pradyo Siyo Ka Bhasha Samakistha Siyo Keshava Sita Dhik Kim To Bhasheto Kim Asito Brajeto Kim. And in answer to this question, uh, Krishna uh, gives a description of a person who uh, is a Jivan Mukta person who has attained the life of well being. Please see. Please note that this is the ultimate state of well-being which is being described in the Gita. This is not the virtue which is being enjoined uh, on lesser models. Uh, the Gita is not saying that uh, practice this state. Uh, it uh, uh, fully realizes that a bound individual or an ordinary individual cannot just act as a Sitoprobio. Uh, that can be possible only on attaining liberation. So, uh, gives a very detailed description of this life of virtue. This is the uh, description of the ultimate state of well-being, which we find in the Gita. This description of a life of excellence or a life of virtue, however, gives rise to many important philosophical questions. The rest of the Gita is devoted to answering these questions, which are arising out of this monistic conception of the real self. The most important question is, is this ultimate state of excellence or virtue a mere utopia that cannot be attained by the majority of human individuals or is a life of virtue possible even for ordinary bound individuals? To answer this question, the Gita presents the theory of Karma Yoga, where Yoga is defined as Yoga Karma Koshalam. Now, we enter into the more tricky parts it is said that Jivan Mukti or liberation in this life can be produced only by one thing and that is the final immediate awareness of self or Atman. They are referring to the scriptures, the famous Chandakya Shruti, Taroti Shokam Atmavid. Shoko here means Agyano which is the root cause of all suffering. Avidya, which is the root cause of all suffering and that can be transcended only when one attains the final immediate awareness of Brahman. That is a, an aparakshanu uh, bhava, an immediate awareness, but what does its immediacy consist in? We shall come back to that question later on as Inanidhi raised the question about perception. We'll, if time permits, I shall have occasion to a few words on this, uh, on the nature of this final immediate awareness of Brahman. Now, this final immediate awareness of Brahman produces Jivan Mukti. And on attaining Jivan Mukti, a person becomes Thita Pratyum. And he uh, is supposed to live, uh, supposed to be in a state of excellence. But we shall later see that this state also has many problems. Even at this state, he has to fight. The Yuvan Mukta Yogin also is under the spell of his Prarakta Karma, under his moral luck, so to speak. Okay, uh, I shall come back to this question. And Madhushudano uh, addresses this question of moral luck and Purushokaro, that is freedom of will, uh, in very great detail that what should prevail on what is the prarabdho overriding over Purushokaro or can Purushokaro override over one's moral luck and moral luck is nothing but the uh, karmic uh, outcomes which have accumulated through one's own actions of previous lives and in this life before attaining liberation. So moral luck here is nothing but a conglomerate of the virtues and the vices accumulated by oneself, by one's own uh, righteous and um, vicious actions. Okay. Uh, 
uh, and if this moral luck is overriding, if it controls all aspects of an agent's action, then the agent cannot have any freedom whatsoever, then how uh, that agent can, can be motivated or how that agent can work towards attaining liberation. This problem occurs, how one can be pravritto towards kaivalyo, how can we explain kaivalyatha pravritti, that is pravritti that leads to liberation. If moral luck is so very important, if the karmic outcomes are so controlling, so determining, then one can't have any uh, uh, freedom of will at all. Then the, uh, our uh, egos, the bound cells, are fully determined by cause and loss. What will happen to freedom of will? Mudhusudan addresses all these questions uh, while commenting on the fifth and the sixth chapter of the Gita. Now, um, but this knowledge cannot be attained by anybody and everybody. We are not entitled to this knowledge or to pursue this path of knowledge. Okay, why? Because our minds are not purified. We are not possessors of pure minds. So, first we need to purify our minds, to purify ourselves by performing righteous actions, dutiful actions, following the scriptures and then only when our minds are purified then certain properties will arise in the mind which are called the short shampattis samadhamo uparati tiktitiksha samadhana shraddha and then if a person has a burning desire for liberation just as a person whose uh, hair is on fire uh, such as for water if that kind of desire is present uh, in the mind of an agent, then only he can be called a mumukshu, then only he is entitled to read the scriptures. We are not even entitled to read Atharta Pradhamoji Kasa properly. Okay, because only a sadhu, only a monk who has, uh, who has performed his viroja homo, who has sacrificed his entire early life, who has made a shadow of his Purvashram uh, by performing Viroja Homo. Uh, only a person who is Uparato uh, is the primary uh, person who can read the Vedantic texts. Yes, we are all Adhikaris in a secondary sense. Uh, Shankara himself grants that a person who has Shraddha, who has Vishwaso in the um, uh, scriptural uh, teachings, in the advices, uh, who has uh, who have places his credence, his trust on the teachings of his preceptor, he also is a secondary Odhikari, he also, he or she can pursue the Vedantic texts. Okay, we are not even entitled to read them. <laughs> now, uh, the Gita says, but still, uh, such persons, such bound individuals like Arjuna can also lead a virtuous life. He can also do something else. What can he do? He can perform his ordinary actions in a different way and which is koshalam. Yoga karmasu koshalam. He can perform his duties belonging, pertaining to his own station of life. Okay? If he is a sweeper, he can sweep the rooms, he can sweep the toilets and still he can perform this action like a yogi by having a koshalam. And what is this kosha? The Gita introduces the notion of nishkama karma in answer to this question. This, that what is this kosha? Nishkama karma, of course, means farabi sandhi radita karma. That is when one does not entertain any attachment whatsoever towards the outcome of the action, but performs uh, the action from a motive of duty because it needs to be performed, then only it can be said that uh, the agent is performing that action in a nishkamo manner, in a falavi sandhi radhita manner. Uh, in, he or she can perform any duty, any duty which is a sadharata dharma, which is prescribed for all. He or she can uh, perform a specific duty which is uh, prescribed for his 
specific station of life and he can perform any duty uh, with this attitude. This is an attitude or a disposition of the mind. But does the practice of Nishkama Karma directly lead to the life of uh, ultimate bliss in which the liberated person performs only detached actions? This question is answered in the negative by Mudhusudana Saraswati. He offers extensive arguments to refute Jnana Karma Samuchaya Gaur. Now what is the problem? The problem is uh, can karma yoga lead to das karma yoga or can karma yoga itself lead to liberation or can bhakti yoga itself lead to liberation or is a synthesis of the three yogas prescribed in the Gita possible at all or is it prescribed by the Gita? Is the synthesis prescribed? This is where uh, classical uh, Vedanta differs sharply from later practical Vedanta. Classical Vedanta says that no such synthesis is possible. Uh, that is, no such synthesis is either needed, neither needed, nor possible. Why is it not needed? Because uh, liberation in the final analysis can be produced only by one means. And that is, on hearing the scriptural statement, Thoughts form in a purified mind. When a purified mind encounters the statement thoughts form he has a final immediate awareness of the self. Okay, so they resort to Shabda Parakshobar. This is the official position of the Vivarana school of Advaita Vedanta. Even the Bhavati school does not subscribe to this view. Uh, Bhajashwati Mishra shall subscribe to, this, uh, to the view which is known as Monat Aranata Bhad. Bhajashwati Mishra says, says that liberation occurs when uh, the mind is purified. Uh, when there is a Puripako, a Purnata, uh, uh, when uh, performing Nididhyasana or Dhyana continuously, uh, the person attains a state of ultimate purification, then from that purification, uh, then that purified mind. See, here the instrument, the pramana, the epistemic instrument is the purified mind itself. That purified mind, it uh, can grasp the nature of consciousness. So that purified mind is the pramana, it is the instrument, it is the corona which grasps the true nature of consciousness. This is known as Mono Karanata Bhadu. And Mananana Mishra referred to a third view which is known as Prasam Khyana Bhadu where uh, liberation occurs from Nididhyasana itself. So these are the three theories about how liberation is produced. Shadha Paraksha Bhadu, Mono Karanata Bhadu and Prasam Khyana Bhadu. There is no other theory. Prevalent among the Advaita Vedantis. These are the only three theories. Now, here, they are saying that, so if these are the only ways in which liberation can occur, liberation cannot occur from the performance of Nishkama Karma or even from entertaining the high state of devotion towards God. Okay, so uh, Karma and Bhakti are not the instruments of liberation, are not the means uh, by which liberation can be attained. And they are uh, showing that no conglomeration between Jnana, Karma or Jnana and Bhakti are possible either. Why? Because the Gita itself says, Durena hi avaran karma, buddhi yoga dhananjayo, buddha sharanam anvichyo, kripana halavetaro. That means that karma is always avaro or uh, it is always inferior to knowledge. It is uh, Jnana is fair, Jnana is fresco to karma. Karma is our. And there cannot be any relation between part and the whole, <coughs> between karma and Jnana. There cannot be any angangi bhavo. There cannot be any shesho sheshi bhavo. Okay? And the person who is entitled to pursue the path of karma is not the same person who is entitled to 
follow the path of knowledge. We are entitled to follow the path of karma alone. We are not entitled to pursue the path of knowledge. That is why karma yoga was delineated in such great detail before Arjuna, because Arjuna was not entitled to follow the path of knowledge. He was an ordinary, he was an ordinary bound individual like us. Okay. So the entire karma yoga, the entire thesis of Nishkarma karma is prescribed for us, for bound individuals like us, to perform our duties in a detached manner. So there is a, a notion of duty here, and does it come into conflict with uh, this notion of Nishkarma karma? We shall see. Now, uh, we are now moving on uh, to the concluding section, and we are uh, trying to answer certain questions. I do not know whether I shall be able to answer these, all these questions or even suggest any solutions to all these questions within this uh, short time period. Is the ethics of the Gita consequentialist? Oh, yes, Shitam Shuddha? Yes, uh, I would like to say a few words on Samatho as well. Now, uh, Nishkano, performing Nishkano Karmo also entails uh, maintaining an attitude of samatva towards uh, various polar uh, things in life, that is various polar concepts of life. The uh, term uh, samu occurs uh, first in sukha dukhe sami kritva labha labhu jaya jayu tato yudhaya yudhyasyo noivam papam avapsyasi. This is the first place where the term samatva occurs. That is, uh, Krishna is enjoining that you must uh, be, uh, must bear the same attitude towards happiness and suffering, towards pleasure and pain, towards uh, joy and parajal, uh, victory and defeat. Okay, and you have to engage in work having this attitude of samatva. And unless you have this attitude of samatva, you cannot perform your duty in a nishkama manner, in a paladi sandhi logika manner. You cannot be attached with one pole. Unless you are detached from both the poles, you cannot be paladi sandhi logika. You must detach yourself from both the poles. Okay? And then the main uh, word uh, is coming later. Uh, it is said that Esha Bhita Sankhe Buddhi Yoga Mimam Shrinu Buddhya Yukta Jaya Patho Karma Bandham Prahasyasi. Now, here Buddhi Yoga uh, refers to Karma Yoga and not the Sankha Yoga as prescribed in the second chapter of the Gita. Buddhi Yoga here means performing Nishkama Karma, performing Yoga, which is Karma Sankha and they are saying that the, uh, all our defects which uh, vitiate our mind because of which we cannot be, we are not entitled to pursue the path of knowledge is because of our past actions, because of the results of our past actions. And all the results of our past actions can be dispelled, dispelled only by performing virtuous actions. So, Mosasudana writes, Karma nimitta jnana pratibandha, karma noivo, dharma kheno aponetu shakyate. That means the obstacles which are accumulated by karma, by our past actions, can be removed, can be dispelled only by dharma. And dharma is Performing Nishkama Karma. Dharmena Papam Apadudoti. This has also has been stated in the scriptures. <laughs> Madhushudana is showing that this teaching of the Gita is in consonance with the scriptures. It is not in violation of the scriptures. But of course, the Gita has given it a, an entire new dimension. In this way, the conception of Nishkama Karma perhaps was not present in the Vedas. They are, they, uh, the Vedas say dharmeno papam apanudati. But this paladi sandhi yoito karma, this is of course uh, 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 introduced.
by the reader. Now, so uh, the question that we I need to address first is the ethics of the Gita consequentialist? Yes, it is. Because uh, the Gita is a moksha shastra like all other uh, orthodox uh, philosophies of ancient India. Now, in fact, even the Mimamsa philosophy posited liberation as the ultimate end, as the highest end of human life. There, there was only a very small fraction of the Mimamsa system who were not Mokshavadis. Okay. They were the Karmavadi Mimamsa school. And uh, to the tenets of this Karmavadi Mimamsa system, we do not have any other reference save only in the Gita. The Gita refers and refutes the view of the Karmavadi Mimamsatos in three verses of the second chapter. Yam Imam Pushpitam Vacham Prabodantiya Vipashtito Veda Vada Vatah Patho Namiya Dosti Tibadino. They say Namiya Dosti. That is apart from heavenly pleasure, nothing else exists. Yes, see the Gita Shuta. Should I stop? No, no, no. Okay. Okay, okay. I will keep time for discussion. Uh, and uh, so, uh, all systems of orthodox, uh, uh, all orthodox systems of classical India, they posited the goal, the highest goal of liberation for their own philosophy. Gita also is a moksha shastra. The entire teaching is directed towards uh, overcoming our sufferings, overcoming our uh, uh, miseries. So, it is con consequential. The consequence, the ultimate consequence can be produced only by a special form of immediate awareness, not a sensory perception, a special form of immediate awareness. Okay, which is also called Pratyaksha or Parakshanuha. Now, but uh, in order to attain this state of immediate awareness, final immediate awareness and Jivan Mukti, one has to uh, follow certain righteous actions. Now, what are these righteous actions? Are we to blindly uh, follow the duties prescribed in the scriptures? No, that is not the teaching of the Gita. The teaching of the Gita is, it must be, the duties must be performed with a virtuous attitude, with a specific attitude, with this samatva, having this samatva by exercising this attitude of the mind where one detaches itself from all the pose, from all the extremes and uh, just performs the action uh, from the motive of duty. It needs to be performed. The agent performs the action solely out of this motive that it needs to be performed. Okay. And it is shown that even uh, an action which is usually performed for attaining some goal, such as the Kamya Karmos, even they are performed with this attitude, they may lead to Vividisha, a severe desire for knowledge. Here comes the importance of the very important Vividisha Sruti, Tametam Vedanu Vachaneno, Brahmana Vividoshanti, Jogeno, Jyane Daneno, Taposa Amasha Genucha. Why is this Sruti so important? This Sruti has been utilized by Ramanuja Charju, by Matvacharyu, to establish Gyano Karma Samuchayavadu. That is, uh, liberation cannot be produced unless one performs virtuous actions. Uh, apart from pursuing knowledge, one also needs to have devotion in one's mind, one also needs to perform virtuous actions. That was the uh, position of Ramanuja Charju. And that is why Ramanuja Charyu considers Shankara to be his main opponent. Uh, Shankara didn't see, Shankara had not seen Ramanuja because Ramanuja was later than Shankara. But later Shankarites also think that Ramanuja and Matva uh, were their main opponents because they upheld Gyanaparma Samuchayava. Uh, so the actions are to be performed virtuously with keeping, having this disposition towards action. And this disposition is the main thing. Even a Kamya Karma is performed with this disposition, it will lead to an entirely different outcome. 
that has been stated very clearly. Uh, now, what are the factors that are conducive to practicing virtues? And the Gita says, uh, just like the Sankha philosophers, that the prakriti or the avidya, which is the root cause of the universe, the um, prakriti, uh, the term prakriti is used by the Advaita Vedantins as well. But the Advaita Vedantins and the Sankha Yoga systems do not mean the same thing by the term prakriti. Uh, on the point of view, prakriti is something which is not ultimately real, which is not avadito, which, is, which will be falsified when all jivas attain liberation. But on the Sankha Yoga view, prakriti is as real as the manifold purushas. Okay, so uh, on the point of view, prakriti is not ultimately real. But this prakriti is constituted of three gunas, sattva, rajas, and tamas. And these three gunas have play a very, very important role. They constitute the doiva sampada, the doivi sampada, uh, or the asuri sampada, that bring about, that are operating in bringing about this specific attitude of samatva, of tulvatva. Okay. Uh, it is said in the Gita, sattvat samjayate dhyanam, rajat parmani bharata, dhyanam avritya kutama, so it is uh, when there is a predominance of the guna sattva in uh, one's mind, only then uh, one can lead a virtuous life. And this guna has, uh, can have a predominance in one's mind only when uh, one eats certain type of foods, only when one leads certain type of, a particular type of life. Okay. If I eat rajasic uh, food, if I eat tamasic food, if I lead a rajasic life, if I lead a tamasic life, uh, uh, rajagun will be predominant in my mind or tamagun will be predominant in my mind. This is very obvious. But the point which is not so obvious is this, that unless we uh, practice a holistic, virtuous life, both in physical and uh, both in uh, the, uh, 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 both in the physical realm and in the mental realm, we cannot attain uh, this uh, virtue. We cannot practice this virtue of some. Okay. And uh, one other thing that so Gita enjoins or prescribes a very holistic life, and they say that all these attributes are attributes of the mind not attributes of the self. If they were attributes of the self, then they could not be given up. Then there could not have been, no change can be brought about in those attributes. But they are uh, attributes of this, uh, of the mind, of the nervous system, uh, of the complex which is constituted of uh, the physical and the conscious parts. And so changes can be brought about. Now, to go into the problem of the moral luck. Mudhu Sudhana says that uh, luck, what is meant by bhagyo? In our term, uh, it is bhagyo. Okay. Now, what is bhagyo is nothing but the accumulated results of one's own actions. So, we cannot blame any other person for uh, our fate or our situation of life. We cannot blame any other person. I cannot blame my father, I cannot blame my mother, I cannot blame anybody. If I have to blame anybody, I have to blame myself. So what is bhakya or what is moral law is created by my own actions. But do they present an obstacle which cannot be uh, overcome by one's purushokaro? The uh, point here is uh, even when one attains Jivan Mukti, the Prarabdha stays operating. The Prarabdha Karmas, they remain operating. Uh, Prarabdha uh, can be uh, destroyed only by enjoying the fruits of those forms. <coughs> now what is Prarabdha? Prarabdha is those sets of actions which have started producing their effects at the time of one's birth. And there are many other actions uh, which are uh, which have not started producing effects that are called those actions are called anarabdha karma and samchita karma. All those samchita karmas are destroyed at the time of 
जीवन मुक्ति ज्ञानाग्निं सर्व कर्माणि भस्म सात पुरुते तथा गीता तीन्त चैप्टर ओके सो द संचित एंड अनारब्ध कर्मों जा बर बट व्हाट विल हैपन टू द कारब्ध कर्मों दी विल पोस ऑफ स्टैकल आफ्टर ऑफ स्टैकल इवन टू अ जीवन मुक्त योगी एंड मधुसूदन सेज दैट इवन अ जीवन मुक्त योगी विल हैव टू प्रैक्टिस द वर्चुअल्स ऑफ निष्कामो कर्मों for his mononasho and vasanas khayo for destroying his own memory traces. So even a yuva jivan mukta yogin is not free from performing nishkama karma. He will have to go on performing the nishkama karmas so that his mind, the mind which is creating so much obstacle, is finally destroyed and he can attain video mukti. And he will have to go on uh, performing actions for destroying his previous sanskaras. The sanskaras will raise their heads like uh, the uh, uh, hydra of uh, Greek mythology and uh, create obstacles in the path of the Jivamukta Yogi also. And the uh, legendary hydra can be slayed only by uh, practicing virtue practicing the virtue of Nishkama Karma. But one can, if one wills to do so, so one's own uh, Purushokaro is not fully controlled by one's karma. If a person wills to do so, he can start acting otherwise. That is to free oneself from the bindings of one's past, uh, 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 the results accumulated from one's own past actions. That is modern life. So I end my lecture here. Thank you. So thank you, Dr. Bhattapadha, for yes. the excellent exposition of the ethics of the Gita. So now it will be open for discussion. Yes. Dr. Chakravarti. Well, I uh, I'll make two brief uh, mentions. Yes. One is Sukhe Dukhe Swami Kritwa. Lava Yahu. Well taken. Uh, but we have to make a special, um, pay our special attention here. Uh, when karma yoga is being performed, karma is for towards an end. So if Arjuna is fighting, Arjuna is fighting to, uh, to win. He is not fighting to lose the battle. The uh, strategy of the fight is, is to be laid toward winning the battle. So winning is the... Uh, so it doesn't mean that uh, everything goes away, uh, falls apart, is leveled down. Yes, if defeat comes, with what attitude? Is the defeat going to be mm, uh, uh, addressed? Yes. Uh, that's the that's the issue. So samatvam comes here in the sense that in life there is mm, uh, pleasure, there is pain, and there is a harmony between the two, and that has to be realized. But okay. well, that's a, a side comment. I mean, Lava and Jaya don't lose their, I mean, Jaya and uh, Paraja don't lose their distinction. Not at all. Even at the highest level. Okay. And, uh, well, from one angle, yes, it does. The, the, from the affective angle, if it happens, how the, do I take it? But not from the, from the cognitive and angle. Yes, I certainly will be um, will be doing business to prosper, love. Uh, Just one addition to what... Uh, uh, let me finish the other yes. one. You don't have to come uh, to, to, to detail answer because we are already late. The other one is I was uh, Sri Aravinda. By the way, as I mentioned to you earlier several times, Vritti uh, Yoga, he translates as yoga of the intelligent world. But he, this is not his translation of Jnana Yoga or Karma Yoga. 
Buddhi Yoga, specifically, he translates yoga as the intelligence, yoga of the intelligence, well. It's a very good translation. Mm. Well, by the way, it is not Karma Yoga. I mean, he, uh, it is very uh, difficult to make sense of what he is saying, but one thing is absolutely clear, he is not conflating the two. Buddhi Yoga, or, I mean, Organa Yoga, or Karma Yoga, these three are diff 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 um, quite different, though intertwined. Uh, I had the feeling that Buddhi Yoga is ingredient for all the yogas. Uh, this is what I had a sense I could make out of his writing. But just to mention this. No, just the, one uh, addition from the Advaita perspective. Yes, uh, Buddhi Yoga analyzes all actions because the, all Indian philosophers, including the Advaita Vedanta Prince, who say that actions can have three forms. Mental, that is cognitive action, physical, and verbal, or linguistic act. Now, the mental act is logically prior to a physical act or the linguistic act. So, unless one practices buddhi yoga, unless one attains samatva in one's own buddhi, one cannot attain samatva in the physical realm. One cannot attain samatva in the linguistic realm. So, um, first, the cognitive part is the most important part. One must be very clear in one's mind what one wants to do and what one not, ought not to do. And then that uh, cognition will translate itself into physical action and linguistic impulse. So that is the primary part. Professor Yes. No, I have, that is my question, my query, which I am putting to you. That here, objective of this conference that we are trying to, yeah, trying to develop world and actually it is strictly confined to the interpretation of Gita from the point of view of Gurata Dikita. As we go to that place, what will be your observation? Uh, okay, I think that uh, the, uh, the uh, excellence of the Advaita interpretation is that it takes into account all uh, verses of the Gita and all aspects of the Gita. It's not partial to any aspect. So uh, the excellence of this interpretation, in fact, and uh, we always judge uh, the excellence of uh, one interpretation in comparison to another. What are the criteria? The criteria, of course, whether they are the, the interpretation occurs a comprehensive explanation of the entire text. The first criterion, of course, is comprehensiveness. Whether it can account for all the nuances, all the specific details. So that is also another criterion. And I think Gurathu Deepika or Shankar, especially Gurathu Deepika, uh, meets these criteria. And uh, for, in the sense that it's a very strong interpretation. It has the potens potentiality to refute other interpretations. It's a powerful interpretation. Uh, while, while we come to interpretations, the power, the potentiality becomes more important. There is no such thing as an absolutely right interpretation or an uh, absolutely wrong interpretation. The strength of the interpretation is what matters. All these are coherent systems. They are proposing coherent theories, coherent theories of interpreting our entire life and experience. And all the propositions, they mutually support each other, one another, and stand and fall together. So if a hypothesis is to be accepted, it needs to be accepted totally. It can be given up in favor of any other hypothesis, say that proposed by Ramanujo or Matvo or Balabanga. We can do so. We are free to do so. But these are all coherent theories, which uh, where all the propositions mutually entail one another. So they're standing. I came late, so I have missed the last talk. Major part of it. But this, uh, you, you said, luck is bhagya. That, that I did not understand. Because in the idea of luck, luck is something that turns in your favor. Bhagya does not connote that name. 
No, model lab does not all, uh, I was referring to model lab, not any and every kind of lab. Model lab is that over which an agent doesn't have any control. And that was the famous paradox of moral law as formulated by Michael Slough. What was Michael Slough's argument? He said that uh, an agent cannot be held responsible for his actions if he is not in control of those actions. But a normal agent is not in control of various factors that are controlling his actions. All these factors constitute moral law. So how can the agent be held responsible for his actions? And Michael Slope said, observed, that no duty ethics can solve this paradox of moral law. And as uh, uh, Maharaji has very clearly shown that virtue ethics can solve, in a way, the problem of the moral law. That part has been uh, discussed in great detail by you. To yes, a yes, yes, yes. 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 Invariably, you see it, Rupak. Congratulations. And since you explained so much, I'd like you to, uh, to uh, explain another point. It's not clear to me. Uh, you're talking about the Jivan Mukta. I'm saying that the Jivan Mukta has the character karma that we still have to go through. And that is uh, equated with some kind of model. It's similar to. Similar to one, that is at least his bhagyo. In whom Ram Krishna Paramod Hamsa suffered from cancer. And for that, for that, what is needed is karma yoga. Hmm. My question is, what will be the place of bhakti yoga for a jiva mukta? Is there any place? Yes. But I would like to yes, understand what it is. I don't think it has been very much discussed. No, I haven't discussed bhakti at all. I didn't have time to discuss bhakti. In fact, Madhushudana devotes the entire sec second shatku of the Gita, uh, comprising six chapters of the Gita, uh, to explain the concept of the bhakti. In this context? In yes, in, in, context. In, yes, in the Jiva Mukta's concept, context, in every context, the Advaita Vedantins have a very specific definition or specific explanation of bhakti. Bhakti is the, not merely uh, submission. Usually, bhakti is understood as uh, unconditional submission to someone or to some higher being. Suppose you are my teacher. Hmm. Uh, in fact, all of you are like my teachers. You belong to uh, my teacher's generation. And if you tell me to do something, and if I do that uh, by having unconditional faith in you, then I have bhakti towards you. Suppose I am mentioning a very crazy example. My teacher and Professor P.K. Mukhopadhyay, I am naming their names, Professor Ashok Kumar Mukhopadhyay and Professor P.K. Mukhopadhyay didn't allow students to open the caps of their pens, to open their caps of their pens in, in, class. their, class, in their classes. When they first said this thing, all students, they thought, this person is a crazy person. He's mad. How can we remember so many things on the groundwork and on the sankyo without opening the cap of our pen? Okay? But he did, but we had submission towards him. Hmm. And see the result? Uh, everyone, uh, we do not have fear of forget. We have transcended our fear of forgetting something. Just, you tell me a phone number, like a, my student, I won't be taking a note. I'll try to keep it in my mind. Because my teacher taught me, Okay, so by having submission, by having bhakti in a way, I, my memory was trained, my memory was trained by them. Okay. So, two questions. One is relating to... No, the, the answer was not given to you. The bhakti here is, of course, a sense of identity with pure consciousness. And that is uh, when uh, at Please least I have... identified as a... Uh, no, uh, we are bound individuals. We don't have that sense of identity. The Jiva Mukta? The Jiva Mukta has realized this identity. But even a Jiva Mukta cannot stay in that state of asamkha gyato samadhi for more than 21 days. 
If a person stays in that state of chitta vritti nirodho for more than a period of 21 days, he will die. Unless he comes back, he will die. One cannot stay in that state uh, forever. So, what is the point? The point is, I must place credence, place my trust in the teachings of the scriptures. Somehow, I must place my trust. Suppose I encounter a person, a yogi, wearing some torn clothes. One day I encountered uh, our old teacher, Professor Dutadash Bhattapadhyay, who was wearing a torn Punjabi hmm, and a torn dhuti, uh, which were uh, sealed uh, at many places. And he was so blissful and discussing Kant and Bradley and so many things at length. And uh, when I came out of my such place, I just wondered, why is this person so happy? What is the uh, um, cause of his happiness? So somehow, even a bound individual, an ordinary individual, must have some sort of shraddha, some sort of astikya buddhi in Guru Padishta Vedanta Vakku. Guru Padishta Vedanta Vakkeshu shraddha, uh, that is the definition, Vishwas of Sraddha. Sraddha is defined as Guru Padishta Vedanta Bhakkeshu Vishwasu. We must place our trust in what is being uh, told, in what is being told by the scriptures, what is being told by the preceptors. And if we don't have Bhakti, we can't place our trust. That is the first step of Bhakti. And when a person attains Dhiva Mukti, he has tasted consciousness. He has tasted, he has encountered, he has had first-hand experience of that pure consciousness. But one cannot stay in that state of kosam pragyanta samadhi uh, for very long. Even Ramakrishna they prescribe bhava mukhe thako, that is come back to ordinary life and have karuna towards other individuals. Otherwise, the seva yoga cannot be exercised. And the Seva Yoga is a contribution of practical Vedanta, which was not there, I should say, in ancient Vedanta. This is a very, very important contribution of Swami, of practical Vedanta. Uh, so, two questions, we can, we can answer them later if we're running out of time. The first one relates to what, what Shiva Shiva Nidhani raised, which is, are you, I mean, I read Sri this Dawn Shiva Gita, for instance. Precisely in those places where the Gita is talking about karma yoga and ethics, that I find the authentic interpretation to be the most dubious. So, for instance, we get something like karma yoga in some system, asita janatadya. And again, Shankara and his, and his followers have to resort to this adhikari deva. There's no hint of adhikari deva in the sloka itself. And again, the one that you mentioned, dhunena, yoga, dhananjaya, bhutta, sharanamukta, kripana, adhikari here again, why should we interpret Bhutti Yoga as Jnana Yoga? This is problematic to me. No, Bhutti Yoga is not Jnana Yoga. Oh, it yes, is performing right. actions with Bhutti. That is uh. what Sri Sanshuddha said. That yeah. is performing uh, yoga mm -hmm. with uh, uh, having the right kind of Bhutti. Okay, okay, so let's separate that. But let's say the Karma Yoga is something in for instance. Yeah. There are places where, because Advaitans are constrained by their framework, which yes. is that Karma yeah. Yoga is only Chitta Sishuddha Karma Nasa Vasti And whereas, Sometimes we would say, Shankara tortured the, the scriptures to suit his own philosophy. I get the same thing when it comes to Karma Yoga, where Gita is directly stating Karma, from karma Yoga alone, Janaka attained perfection. Advaitins are in trouble. And arguably, you know, people like Sri Aravindo or Swami Vivekananda said, each of the four yogas are directly in advance to moksha. Paths to moksha. You can find Sankhi Yoga, Pratakvala, Prabhadantina Pandita. Again, again, the Advaitins have to be a bit. The first thing is just arguing out. I think the difficult issue is the Advaitic interpretation of the Gita the most plausible? Why or why not? It's a huge issue. Yes, there is a huge issue. The second one is you raised a very important question at the beginning of your talk, which I don't, I haven't got a very clear answer to it. Mm -hmm. To what extent is the Gita's ethics a virtue ethics? And I think you hint at the end toward a no and saying it's more consequentialist than virtue ethics. But what, what is your answer to that question? Yes, my answer is yes, it's consequentialist. Still, uh, the consequence cannot be attained without practicing this virtue. And the consequence entails being in a state of virtue. The consequence itself uh, entails that a Jivan Mukta yogi, 
he is in this state of bliss, this state of well-being, which is described as sito, sito pratyo. So, in a way, the uh, state, the ultimate state of well-being is being identified with a life of virtue, life of higher virtues. And this life cannot be reached by pursuing, by practicing virtue on a lower level. Unless one practices virtue on our level, one's mind will not be purified. If our mind, uh, minds are not purified, we cannot have the ultimate knowledge. If we do not have the ultimate knowledge, we can't be a state of prajyo, we cannot attain that high state of well-being. So virtue is talked of at two levels, on two levels. The first is, uh, the Gita uh, describes a state of ultimate flourishing, an ultimate uh, level of bliss. Okay, for the yogi, Jiva Mukta Yogi. But that state can be attained by practicing virtue on a lower level, by people like us. So it is talking of virtue on various levels. And the ethics in its ultimate analysis is consequentialist. And duty is uh, uh, ascribed a sort of uh, subordinate rule. Unless duties are performed with the right kind of attitude, uh, no uh, high state of well-being uh, will be generated. Well, the expression virtue um, <coughs> should have uh, be used uh, with one meaning. Uh, virtue is a character state and that's what, what makes virtue ethics. And virtuous actions, papo uh, or punna, punna is virtue. This is uh, going to several dimensions with the use of vir virtue ethics. Whether it is virtue ethics, there is only one criterion for that. If it is not, say there is no virtue, uh, the character state, state to hold on to. Is there any? If yes, point that out. Yes. Uh, one thing to comment here, not actually comment, it is yes. also my observation. In fact, on the different theoretical aspect of virtue ethics, in fact, Michael Slot has done wonderful work yes. and he has done different varieties of virtue ethics, yes. agent-based, agent-focused yes. and agent-prior virtue ethics. Mm -hmm. But the way you are putting here virtue turns out to be something posterior. And my, my observation here is that in Gita, when it is said about Nishkam Karno, Actually, the same judha that has to be done. Yes. That means the same action can be viewed both as sakam and as niskam. Yes. The real difference is on the attitude. attitude. Yes. And this attitude, that is the virtue. Yes. That is niskam. That is, that is. And the point is that even if the action is performed as niskam and sakam, it will produce its result. Not but different results. It will produce different results. No, because when... No, that is the point. No, no, result. Yes. It, is, it, is, it has been stated in the Gita as well. That is, Nishkam form is that it is such that its result will not bind you in bondage. Yes. It will produce result. Yes, it, it will. it will not produce bondage. Yes. That means your psychological attitude has to be changed. Yes. Because even if Juddha is done, there will be death. Yes. It can't be avoided. That's the result. Huh? That's the result. But there yeah. will be results on another plane. That, that, that is not the cause yes. of karma bandhana. Mm. And so in that sense, you can say that why it is not producing karma bandhana because attitude of the agent has been changed. No. That but, is that no. is his performing action as a nishkam yogi. That is the point. No, humanity is absolutely right. Even a nishkama karma, just like shakama karma, will produce results. But uh, 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 from an empirical or a mundane point of view, they may produce or they can produce the same result. 
If one performs the judo in a sapamo manner, one may win the battle. If one uh, performs, okay, if one performs the judo in a nishkamo manner, one can win the battle. One but, has to win the battle, by the way. Yes, one has to win the battle. Why? Because winning the battle also is important. It's a dharma yuddha. Unless the, 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 the battle is won, there will be uh, much more disaster than it is lost. Okay. So, uh, but the Nishkama Karma will produce outcomes on another level as well. Neha Vikrama Nasti Pratyavaya Na Vityate. And Obhikrama will not be there. And that is, that is, it will not be Buddhya Yukta Jaya Vartha Karma Vandha Mukha Asiyasi. So, another, uh, there will be no Mukshkhaya. But if you perform work, work, with, uh, in a state of uh, buddhi yoga, then you will uh, be able to overcome karma bandhan. So that is also a result. That result will not be produced uh, if one performs work in a sakamu manner. So uh, nishkama yoga produces results. It produces results on many planes, many levels. It will produce some mundane results and it will produce some results in the mind of the agent. And he will not have any pratyabhaya, his obhikrama will be destroyed. Yes. Obhikrama means the result yes. of action. And, uh, and he will be able to overcome karma bandha. Buddhi jipta jaya patra karma bandha mutra asya. Only then he will be able to. Yes. Only that, then is, that is true nishkami. Yes. He is only then. Only then. The only also is very important. But not through avoiding the uh, action, yes. but doing performing the action with the right kind of attitude uh, and to win the war. Hmm. Karma, karma, yes, yes, yes. Karma, 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 uh, I was puzzled to see the Gita in the Vishnu Parv of the Mahabharata. So uh, I never knew it, no one told it to me. And I come from Magadh or Magadh area of Bihar. Uh, and uh, in our village in Gaya district, uh, everyone would advise every other person, don't keep the Mahabharata yeah. in the house. Yes, yes. It will lead to quarrels. Yes, yes. It is a very... Um, it's, this belief is not only prevalent in Bihar. Uh -huh. This is a... Uh, we are prescribed not to uh, keep the picture of Arjuna riding the chariot and uh, Krishna um, uh, is guiding him because that leads to um, Dharma Yudra all the time. It's yeah, against the past. Some clever person Yes. Uh, took the Gita out of the Mahabharata uh -huh. and no one has such taboo against uh, the Gita. In every house you can find it. <laughs> <laughs> when was it done? That's my curiosity. And Gandhi made his own interpretation. Perhaps, yes, it's an important question. Not to it be neglected at all. Not really I all. think uh, uh, we must uh, ascribe this task to Shankaracharya because prior to Shankaracharya, no commentary on the Gita itself was written. But you mentioned Shankara and the Bhagavad Yes. There are other ones, commentaries on the Gita. Yes, there may be very ancient ones, but perhaps there were commentaries on the entire uh, Mahabharata, like the Milavanti. Milavanti. But I think it was Shankaracharya who just extracted this part and wrote a very powerful commentary on it. And that started the lineage. Ramananda Chattu immediately afterwards wrote his own commentary, refuting Shankara's commentary. Ramananda's commentary also is a very large one and very important one. Okay? Martha's commentary is not very large. <laughs> so we conclude. So we thank you, madam, for your excellent presentation. I thank all of you. So let's call it a day. <coughs> thank you. 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 Thank you.